matter what hour your clock strikes, here it's always Halloween. And I'm always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. On the last episode, we traced the roots of Halloween back to the second century Celtic celebration Samhain. We also briefly looked at the impact Romans and Christianity had on the Celts and how this meddling influenced our modern celebrations. But who are the Celts? I always thought of Celts as being Irish. And that is one of the places where Celtic culture still thrives today. But Celts are a broad ethnic group, not an empire or a civilization localized in one area. According to historian Tom Roswell, Celts can refer to indigenous Northwest Europeans who did or do now speak Celtic languages. It can also refer to an ethno-linguistic culture on the continent which encompassed many diverse people. Celtic language speakers were not prehistoric people nor a homogenous racial group. They were actually a vast collection of tribes with origins stretching from Turkey across the Mediterranean and Central Europe to Spain, France, and the British Isles. Hello, governor. They shared languages, religious beliefs, traditions, and art that spanned more than a dozen centuries. We should be asking who aren't the Celts, because they really ran Europe until the Romans were basically like, gimme, I want it. Historians believe Celtic culture started to evolve around 1200 BCE, which was the end of the Bronze Age, called such because copper and bronze were the major hard materials used to manufacture implements and weapons, not because it was the third best age. So we think Celtic culture is a go in the 1200s, but their existence isn't officially documented until about 500 years later. And guess who documented it? A chariot full of gold coins to anyone shouting, the Romans, right now. I love gold! A lot of what we know about Celts came from the Romans, who referred to them at the time as barbarians. A surprisingly evergreen slur that every colonizer uses against the people they want to steal land from. Romans, like all empires, were solely interested in the preservation of their own culture and had everything to gain by painting the Celts as uncivilized simply for speaking a different language and adhering to different cultural traditions. Even the name Celts came from the Greek word Keltoi, and the Roman word Celtai, meaning people of continental Europe who were neither Greek nor Roman. Not only is that deeply lacking in creativity, but how wild is it that the incredibly diverse and wide-reaching tribes were basically just distilled into not being Greco-Roman? You deserve better. It was in the first century BCE when Julius Caesar came in hot and launched a massive military campaign against the Celts, killing them by the thousands and destroying their culture in most of mainland Europe. Supposedly, this was revenge for two invasions the Celts had launched on Rome earlier, but again, we have to take the Romans' word for it. You might be wondering when the creepy part of this podcast starts. But what's eerier than learning that the colonization that tattered the various indigenous cultures in the Americas is actually part of a larger pattern that started more than 2,000 years ago? Ugh, chilling. But seriously, I promise this is all related to Halloween. See, Caesar's Roman armies tried to invade Britain in 43 BCE, and while they were able to take control of England for a few hundred years, They never fully got to Ireland, Scotland, or Wales, which meant the remaining Celts in the British Isles were able to put down roots. And in 407 CE, the Celts took back England. As a result, many Celtic traditions remain evident in the present-day British Isles, and it's exactly why we have Halloween today. As we discussed in episode one, Samhain was a Celtic festival that began over 2,000 years ago in Ireland. It morphed into Halloween after coming in contact with Christianity and the Roman holiday All Saints Day. Therefore, 
If Julius Caesar would have been successful at completely overthrowing the British Isles, then Samhain wouldn't have taken hold, and Halloween would have never been born. We'd just spend all of October celebrating saints and martyrs, which, no shame if that's your thing, but it really doesn't pack the same spooky punch. Although, many saints did die gruesome bloody deaths, which is something. Ew, no, David. 17th century historian Geoffrey Keating wrote of sacred fires lit during Samhain on a hill in Ireland called Talachka, where cattle sacrifices were supposedly made. While there is no hard proof indicating the Celts made animal sacrifices, Talachka was and is real. Also known as Hill of the Ward in County Meath, Ireland, you can visit Talachka and attend the modern Samhain festivals that take place there every year. While the ancient Samhain fire celebrations at Talachka were considered a triumph of light against the darkness of the impending winter, the thin veil between the living and the dead created a sense of dread and unease. While ancestors were welcome home with feasts and altars, similar to those we see in Mexican Day of the Dead festivals, the world of the dead was a complicated place, not only populated by the spirits of the departed, but also with a host of gods, fairies, and other creatures of an uncertain nature. Some of the specific monsters associated with the mythology surrounding Samhain are really something. There's a shape-shifting creature called a puka that receives harvest offerings from the field. Then there's a headless woman dressed in white named the Lady Gwen who will chase night wanderers and is accompanied by a black pig. A very cool accessory for a monster, if I do say so myself. Then there's the Dullahan, who were a death omen to anyone who encountered them. They were impish creatures that appeared as headless men who carried their heads while riding on the backs of flame-eyed horses. An origin story for the legend of Sleepy Hollow, perhaps. A group of kidnapping hunters known as the Fairy Host might also haunt Samhain festivals. Similar are the Slaw, who would come from the West to enter houses and steal souls after revelers went to sleep. Now you know why the Celts had to dress up in animal heads and skins to hide. If we had to face such ghastly creatures on Halloween night today, I doubt anyone would be dressing up as a sexy cat in a hat. Do I make you horny, baby? I could talk about Celtic and Samhain mythology for as long as the hearth fires burn, but it's time to finally dive into how Halloween came to America and examine the ways this holiday is celebrated in other countries and cultures across the world. So please... Join us next week for that excursion. Do you have a Halloween query or memory you want to share? Please call into the All Hallows hotline at 802-532-3323. That's 802-532-DEAD. Or you can write me an eek mail at itsalwayshalloweenpodcast at gmail.com. If you do... You may be featured on our Small Frights episode, which will come out every Friday starting this week. I'd love to hear what you want to learn about on future episodes. I'm also interested in hearing from people with any Celtic background, or anyone who celebrates or incorporates elements of Samhain into their Halloween celebrations. Have you been to Talachka? Do you plan to go? Let me know! It's Always Halloween is researched, written, and performed by me, Luce Tomlin Brenner. The editing, theme music, and sound design is by Pete Burns. Thanks, Pete. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at LTB Comedy and Pete at Mittenberries. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like-minded ghouls can find us. Thanks for listening to It's Always Halloween. Come back next week, if you dare.